So good evening, and tonight we're going to be discussing how you measure darkness, and it's using a device called a sky quality meter or a SQM or just SQM. But as always, first we'll do the news. So the James Webb Space Telescope is getting towards the final phase of commissioning. Um, it's not fully chilled down to where they want it, but all the instruments have been. Uh, the mirrors are well on their way to, to being chilled down. Uh, they've got a few things to deal with as far as calibration goes, but uh, it, it's closing on it. They ought to finish out their uh, commissioning in uh, late May, early June, and then by uh, mid-June, they're going to start doing observing, and then my guess is in uh, either late June to early July, they'll have the first public release of scientific images. Not that the images that have been released thus far aren't intriguing, and they show how much better the instruments on the web and the uh, mirror diameter of the web is above anything that preceded it. Uh, but then people ask questions like, why are there little crosses on all the stars? These are people that obviously don't understand Newtonian telescopes, which have spider veins. And, uh, there are three spider veins on the web that hold up the secondary mirror, just like in a Newtonian. It's just a little weird to see people that own Maxutov Cassegrains or Schmidt Cassegrains or refractors, and they go in and they add the little crosses on them. That just, that's not a real image anymore. But anyway, so um, you can follow the uh, uh, JWST web, W-E-B-B, blog on NASA to find out all the latest stuff. Um, I get emails from the Space Telescope Science Institute that gives me a little more detail, but I still want to know, could you tell me in advance uh, what the target is? What, you know, what's the first public target that you'll see science on? Nope. Got to wait until later in the month. Yep. Mid to late May, not early May. Okay. And SpaceX is busy launching and landing things again. Crew-3 has returned. Uh, they didn't land in the Atlantic. They actually land in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, which is, that's different. But I guess it's just a matter of, um, you know, where they, uh, where the ISS was when they departed from the ISS meant where they're going to land. So if they landed such that, if, you know, two orbits later, they'd be over the Gulf as opposed to over the Atlantic, well, then they land in the Gulf. And the SLS, if you remember the SLS, this was the um, wet dress rehearsal that they did. And they had a few things go wrong for them. Nothing exploded, just, hey, let's fill it up with uh, liquid oxygen. Oh, seems to have a problem with the uh, leaks. Okay, let's fill it up with liquid hydrogen. Oh, we've got a problem with valves sticking. So they never actually filled the rocket to its capacity and did a pressure test. So that's something they're going to have to do again before they can ever launch it is to do a full load pressure test on the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. But they also had a valve problem with the liquid helium. It doesn't burn the liquid helium. It uses the liquid helium as a pressurization agent to pressurize the liquid oxygen tank because oxygen under low gravity tends to form globules and clump up inside the tank and stick to the uh, inner walls of the tank rather than going out the nozzle and making it go, you know, launch. So uh, the upper stage, once it gets above a certain uh, elevation above the earth where there's less gravity, um, they need the helium. And everything was leaking. Either ground stuff was leaking or valves on board the craft were leaking, but yeah, they, they need a big do-over. And they did their analysis and found out what they have to fix. And what they have to fix says, uh, we're not going to try this again until August at the earliest. So they're falling I behind. Think, I think the Ar Artemis project is just lip service. Because it makes no sense for you to go back to the moon for them to go to Mars. I think it's just something like to give money for the industry that makes spacecraft and this will not i i, I will believe when uh, 
when a spacecraft goes around the moon, and then I will believe your Artemis is not just lip service. Well, that, that's that's the funny aspect of this is the way it's scheduled right now. No matter how long it takes, Artemis is going to be the spacecraft that carries the Orion capsule in orbit around the moon, but doesn't land on the moon. It'll be SpaceX with their super heavy in their Starship that actually will land on the moon. So I, why don't they just, you know, sign it over to SpaceX and say, yes, before you land on the moon, why don't you do a couple of orbits first? And then the whole SLS, Orion, all that stuff is like redundant. And it's, you know, it's a lot of billions. So, yeah. But it keeps Boeing in the money. <laughs> and this is a trendy thing that NASA is doing. Um, what they refer to as sonifications. They take data that is not acoustic data and they map it so that it can be translated or mapped down into acoustic frequencies. So they take radio signals and you know map it down to low frequency so it can be heard. And now what they've done is they've taken Chandra X-ray data from 2003 from the Perseus galaxy cluster and taken the X-ray wave data and sonified it. So you can now hear what a black hole sounds like, which is, uh, to quote a Star Trek next generation phrase, that's a load of hooey. <laughs> First of all, oh, it's, it's, in not, the vacuum, no. it's in the vacuum of space. So you're not going to hear it. And even if no, it it's not a bunch of hooey, Monroe. It's like for there are some physicists and some astronomers who uh, be, could see it but became uh, visual uh, impaired. And then they find a way to make it as a sound for them to actually observe and understand the data. And some of them actually resolve like some problems or some equations because they had another way that they think that another way to see uh, with the ears that it's like 3D for them. When we normally, we're, the, we're not impaired, we see stuff outside in our computers and mostly 2Ds. For them, their eyes is 3D all the time. So they can have a, a insight in how things are because their brain are used to think uh, it transdimensionally because of their, uh, the, their eyes are the, their ears. And I've seen the movie Contact, where this was actually played out on camera. Yes. Um, for that purpose, yes, I understand the usefulness of sonification. It's just that they're, gonna, they're going and sonifying stuff that isn't new data, and they're putting it out there published as if it's something new. So they're taking data from 2003. They're shifting it 57 octaves below middle C, and then they're making it audio. But they're releasing it to the public. They're not saying that, you know, they've created something that is providing new science. They're just saying, this is what a black hole sounds like. No, it's not. So, yes, I understand when they're doing it for the purpose of getting a different opinion from people who visualize things differently. I understand that. But the matter, the means by which they're doing this and how they're promoting it, um, might as, well, might as well be watching a sci-fi movie that has explosions in space. So it's been two weeks. Where is that um, new image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy using the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a radio telescope array? I haven't heard about that. That, that was due this week. The collection of data, the analysis is going to take years. No, 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 no. They already had the data. They were already doing the analysis. They said that they're going to publish in the next two weeks, and this week was the second week. So I was expecting to hear something this week, but didn't see anything. So they owe, they owe us a graphical representation of the radio signal they gathered from the Event Horizon Radio Telescope Array over the past five years. So I look forward to seeing that. Uh, you know me, I'm just going to check out what angle did you shoot that at? Okay, so that was all I had for news this week. Uh, do we have any other news items? Okay. Um, as I was, as I was, 
Can yes? you put it on, on video? What is the date for the uh, lunar eclipse that can be visible, visit, visible in the, the whole South Florida? Or, or whole Florida? I can mm -hmm. pull that up. Yep. Well, Time and date is always a good place to go for things like that. And now it's in the chat if anybody wants to copy it. So the, the neat thing about uh, time and date is they give you a whole lot of details, uh, what it's going to look like from your location. Sometimes they get the location wrong. Like they think I'm in West Palm Beach, but that's close enough. They'll tell you where on the earth you can see it. And you can see we're in a nice spot in the uh, part where we can see the total lunar eclipse. And let's see, then they'll give you a timeline. So if you're into, you know, Greenwich Mean Time, UTC, we've got the times for that. And then the times in West Palm Beach and what aspects of it are visible. So uh, on Sunday, May 15th at 9.32 p.m. is when the first contact of the penumbral phase of the eclipse starts. And the maximum eclipse is a little after midnight. So uh, Monday... May 16th in the wee hours of the morning, 12, 11 a.m. And then it will end uh, at uh, shortly before 3 a.m. And it tells you a little bit about the uh, orbital mechanics of an eclipse. How, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a total solar eclipse. We couldn't see it. You could see it if you were in the southern tip of uh, South America or in the Antarctic, but there was a solar eclipse. And then uh, two weeks later, you get a lunar eclipse. And I've got a presentation that I'm putting together that maybe I'll show it this coming Saturday, plus do it live and record it during the uh, actual eclipse. We're planning on uh, doing a, a live event. Unfortunately, the public is not invited, and our members are not invited. But uh, I have arranged for Helen and I to be there. We can record all we want. And if the public walks up and wants to partake of what we're doing, we're to politely ask them to not join us. So any more questions about the upcoming lunar eclipse on May 15th, 16th, overnight? Okay, uh, anything before I start the presentation? So hello again. Tonight we're going to be discussing how you measure darkness uh, with emphasis on a little device called an SQM or sky quality meter. Uh, this came in handy recently as Helen and I were evaluating a, a new potential site for dark sky observing in the western part of uh, Broward County. So how do you measure darkness? Isn't darkness the absence of something? Well, yeah. So uh, I recently did a presentation on how you go about evaluating a dark site for astronomical observing and for public outreach events. So we needed to know, well, how dark is it there? And what things are causing it to not be so dark? Uh, so the first thing you had to identify was, what do you want to see from your dark site? Do you want to just see the moon? Well, that may just be looking to make sure you're clear of obstructions and have good weather. If you want to see brighter planets and certain deep sky targets that are bright, probably suburban dark is likely sufficient. But if you want to do uh, astronomical imaging of deep sky fuzzies, as I call them, galaxies, star clusters, and dim nebulas, you need something that's generally referred to as rural dark, as in no local light sources. But how do you know how dark dark is? And when you want to evaluate several different sites, how do you compare one to another? Well, you have to understand um, the property of darkness uh, for uh, a site and the best way to, to measure that such that it's absent any uh, individual observation or personal biases. And I'm not talking about uh, I'm lying and it's darker than it really is, or I'm lying and it's lighter than it really is. I'm talking about the biases you don't realize exist that do. So the easiest way to judge the darkness of a location is by, as they refer to it, eyeballing it. You look up and you go, looks dark to me, looks darker than it is at my house. Well, that gives you a very, very rough evaluation. And depending upon your individual perception of how dark dark is, or your personal eyeballs, um, or were you looking at something bright before you went to do your evaluation? Did you wait until you regained your dark vision before you said, yep, looks pretty dark? So eyeballing it is a rough approximation. So if you don't have any other means of judging it and you're not going to spend time to getting yourself acclimated to the location before evaluating it, yeah, you can just sort of look around and go, looks kind of dark here. But you can also say, 
Oh, look at all the street lights. Looks kind of bright here. Even if the lights are full cut off on the bottom um, and they don't put up a glow skyward, it may be that there's so much local light that you can never get sufficient dark vision to observe. So when people say, what's wrong with our massively bright white street lights? They're a full cutoff on the bottom. They're not cobras. They're not those uh, uh, acorn type that have light that goes out the top. So they're perfect for astronomy. No. So how do we do comparative star brightness? Well, um, you know, we, we want this to be less biased. So we'll pick a set of stars in certain constellations where we've already prejudged their brightness using something called stellar magnitude. And we'll say, well, if you find the constellation Orion and you can see the two stars at the shoulders and the two stars at the knees and the three belt stars, if you can see all of those, then that gives you an evaluation of how bright the sky is or how clear the sky is. So that's one way to do is to make a magnitude chart and create them in order of uh, bright to dim. And then when you see a certain star, you know that at least that dark. And when you can't see a certain star because it's dimmer than the uh, brightness of the local sky, then you know a, a rough evaluation pretty much on a numerical basis. But there are still biases associated with that as an individual's eyeballs had to judge whether or not they could see that and were they dark vision uh, adapted before they did their evaluation. So it's, it's better than uh, eyeballing it. But uh, there is still some physiologic bias, bias based upon the observer. And uh, it is only good enough to tell you what is bright enough for you to see naked eye. Because you're not using binoculars or a telescope. You're just using your unaided eye. So it's better than eyeballing it, but not quite there yet. What we want to do is, in an unbiased manner, numerically quantify darkness. The dark itself you can't quantify. But what you can quantify is the inverse of that by saying, how bright is it? And there's two different ways you can use devices to do that. You can use less than high quality sensing. There are apps you can run on your mobile phone because your mobile phone has an embedded camera. If the app knows specifically the model of phone that you have and the kind of camera that it has in it, then it can compensate for the nature of the uh, properties and the specifications of the camera as to how wide a field of view can it pick up. Maybe it should discard the pixels along the outer edge to just get the light directly overhead. And do they make sure that you had your phone sort of pointed up to the sky at your extended arm's reach to you know, get the right field of view so there's no local light dome interference with your uh, observing. But even that's not quite good enough. You need to understand how the physics of the light sensor is working compared to the ambient environment. And for that, you need temperature. So when you take a picture with your phone, you don't notice it because you're just looking at a pretty picture. When you take a picture with your phone, if your phone happens to be cooler or warmer, it will make the camera sensor respond differently. Drawing in more light or not drawing in as much light. But when you take your average like photograph, you don't notice that. If it's too dark, you go in and you touch up the brightness. But what you want when you're analyzing the darkness is a standard set of properties and specifications for the sensor so that you know that you're starting from a level playing field and then you factor in the temperature so you have an even more level playing field. And now you can say that this app is meaningful in its digital measurement of the sky brightness. But that's a lot to expect out of some app that a guy threw together overnight and dumped out on the internet for free. There are purpose designed devices for high quality sensing of sky darkness. And it measures in a factor known as magnitudes per arc second squared. And if you think of, um, you know, degrees, minutes, and seconds of sky, that's a narrower and narrower field of view. And then when you fraction the second into 60 seconds, 60 fractions of a second, that's an arc second. So it's a very narrow part of the sky. So you're measuring overhead just that field of view for where you want to get the light from. So you're excluding 
all that light dome around the horizon. So that gives you a better approach to measuring. And the next thing is you don't want to measure it in color because if you've ever heard color has temperature, color has different energy levels. What you want to do is measure the amplitude. You want to measure the brightness in grayscale, in you know, not black and white, but true grayscale. And for this, they use a electronic device called a photodiode or a pin diode. The diode can be compensated for by a temperature sensor. So these devices, these uh, sky quality meters, they have a lens on the front to adjust the field of view. They use a pin photodiode to get a broad spectrum grayscale uh, evaluation of uh, the amount of light coming into the device. Uh, and then they run a little algorithm that will make sure that regardless of the temperature, um, you know, this is the exact measures in magnitudes per arc second squared. So you now have a baseline that you can judge other things from. But it's not perfect because the person extending their arm up to take the measurement, what if they have a shorter arm? What if they're not quite as tall? So when I make a measurement, I'm starting from, you know, six foot three. And by the time I extend my arm, I'm eight plus feet above ground level. When Helen evaluates the same thing, she's a little bit less than that. Now, how much difference does that make? Um, we'd have to do a scientific analysis on a single site to judge that. I'm guessing it doesn't make a dramatic difference, but uh, if somebody is not holding the, the meter directly overhead, they're holding it a little off to one side or maybe towards a light source, that's gonna make a dramatic difference in the measurement. So here is the apparent magnitude. Now. There's a value known as apparent magnitude, and all the things in the night sky have an apparent magnitude. But then when you get to your dark site and whatever instrument you're using to observe this, you now have an actual magnitude. So there's a difference between the apparent magnitude, which is consistent regardless of uh, your instrument and your observing location, and then what you actually observe when you're making measurements, which is the actual magnitude. The way magnitudes work is, they start with an arbitrary zero crossing point, and then things that are brighter than that go negative, and things that are dimmer than that go higher number positive values. So if you said, um, what's zero? Well, zero is uh, close to serious, but you know, not actually serious. Serious is a tiny bit brighter than zero. Well, where would be a full moon? A full moon is about magnitude 13, um, minus 13. What about the sun? Well, that's magnitude 25. Well, the sun's a lot brighter than that, and that's where you learn that this is not a linear scale. This is a scale of exponential differences in magnitude. So when you change something by one, it doesn't go up just by one in brightness. It goes up by an exponential difference in brightness. So if you were to look at something that is serious versus the naked eye limit, which is a little over five, closer to six, then that's the full range of, you know, typically visual is it only goes as far as six. But there's a lot of stuff out there that's far dimmer than that. With your average uh, size, you know, eight to 10 inch telescope, you can easily get in a dark site into the magnitude 10 plus but you need a much larger diameter telescope at a much darker site to get into the 15 plus. And you need to be on a mountaintop to close in on 20. I need to be above the Earth's atmosphere like the Hubble Space Telescope to get to like 28. But even Hubble can't see dimmer than magnitude 28. I don't see the JWST on here. The JWST should be able to see closer to 30 but it's not gonna see like 40. But what is brightness? Uh, brightness uh, can have any, any number of scales, but the, there are units of measure that are for judging brightness. Like when you judge how bright a light bulb is, the light bulb would be measured in ANSI lumens. Lumens is an interesting way of measuring things. It's a unit of measure that is actually a curve based upon the physiological capabilities of a human eyeball. And the human eyeball is more sensitive in the 
greens than it is in the deep reds or near ultraviolet. So lumens are a biased measurement. They're not pure energy measurements. If you look at uh, scientific measurements, SI measurements, you'll find that they use a different unit called a candela. And a candela is the amount of energy flux over a certain square area. And now you can take that concept and measure the amount of light energy in the sky over any amount of square area and in any direction. So when you start measuring the amount of brightness energy that's in the sky, that's the light pollution, um, you can now have a unit of measure that you can communicate to anyone and you know it's digitally accurate over a variety of dark sites you're trying to compare and it doesn't have anything to do with the person whose eyeballs made the measurement and if you have a device like an SQM that can uh, temperature compensate and understands its own pin photodiode, you can now come away with accurate measurements of uh, magnitudes per square arc second of area, which is how you actually want to measure it. So what is a, a sky quality meter internally? Well, it starts with the lens at the front, and there's two different classes of lens. There's the classic and narrow. The first time they came out with the SQM, a company called Unihedron, um, the lens on the front was just to concentrate the light coming in, and the field of view was about 60 degrees. But that was too wide a field of view because it gathered in some of the light from the side and too much of the potential light dome in areas that were not overly bright, but brighter than dark. So it was a little biased. But they've compensated for that. They now have a new model. I won't say new, it's you know, several years old. A newer model called the L, as in uh, narrow field of view lens. So instead of the wide field of view lens like on the classic, it has a narrower field of view that's around 20 degrees. So it takes in less sky, which is really great for not only looking overhead, but if you want to evaluate a particular light source down on the horizon by how that light dome changes over time, then having an L version gives you that ability because you, now you can spot locate bright spots. You can still do overhead, but you can also take measurements around compass ordinal directions at 60 degrees and at 15 degrees and now you can use software to create a light dome map. And then you evaluate that year to year and you can find new light sources and you can judge how things are getting brighter. So the light sensor is a pin photodiode. It has a temperature sensor to adjust for that. And then it has a, a single analog to digital sensor. So the signal coming out of the pin diode is literally just a voltage. So the analog to digital converter is calculating over a range the possible voltage levels and converting those into a digital or numeric value. Then there's a button and you push the button to say, take a reading. Or when you're done taking the reading, you push the button again to turn it off so it saves battery. It has a display on the end of it. And I'll show you a picture of this in a moment. It has a display on the end of it that has two whole numbers and two fractional numbers. And it gives you that digital numeric value so you can take this anywhere and it will you know give you this number but if you hit the button again immediately after taking a reading it will tell you the ambient temperature so if you want to jot that down in your log i got this numeric reading when i was pointing it directly overhead at this temperature the display can also give you error indications like when your battery is low or when it's over the top as in you pointed it at something that's just too bright, um, uh, or if it can't get a temperature sensor reading. And there's a small microcontroller in your little microcomputer that will read the analog to digital converter results, reads the amb ambient temperature, compensates for it, displays the value, and indicates any errors. So it's a rather simple computer. There are fancier models of the SQM that uh, have a data output interface. So the classic or the narrow L um, just has this display on the front. So if you wanted to evaluate, let's say, 10 different locations for how dark they are, how would you record the data? Well, Helen's approach is you take a picture with your cell phone camera of the display reading. That will get you the number. 
But what about the temperature? Well, you could push the button again and take another picture, but that starts to get into like work. So what I did was I bought an SQM that has an ethernet interface so I can connect it up to my laptop and I can mount the SQM on a tripod so it's always at the same height and I can make it you know, 8 feet, 10 feet, whatever I want. And now when I evaluate different sites, it's consistent as to exactly how high up I had it, or what the tilt angle was when I was measuring at uh, 60 degrees or 15 degrees. I can uh, take the data, log it, and put it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then I can create my own sky dome image of it. So that's the reason for it, them having different models. But depending upon how much money you want to spend and what do you want to do with the data that you collect says which model you're going to buy. Uh, the least expensive one is the uh, the classic model. I think they're around 120 bucks now, but I think my Ethernet model was closer to 200 bucks. You can spend $500 and you actually buy the Ethernet model with uh, an enclosure with a lens that goes on top and a bracket for a post so you can permanently mount it uh, in a park. So if you want to measure the night sky overhead every evening, you can do that. And it will be, you know, there's an application for automatically recording it. So as I was mentioning, uh, so you've been tasked with recording um, lots of sources. And uh, if you've got a battery operated device, obviously you can do it for a while until a battery runs out. But you can also get them that have uh, external interfaces. But what you'd like to do is, Record the data, record your location, date and time, uh, the values, temperature, record all this stuff. Well, if you get one of these SQM devices that has a LAN interface, um, you, know, you can mount it permanently, but you can do what I did, was, which is also stick it on the end of a tripod, and now you can automatically collect all this data. So you can record the name of the location that you were doing the observation from. It's uh, GNNS coordinates date and time with high accuracy. You could log any notes like what was the weather like? Or maybe you can reach out and grab the clear sky clock and record that at the same time. And you do this across multiple sites. And now you have an unbiased digital evaluation of dark sites across locations. So somebody doesn't have to say, well, I think this site is darker. You can go, nope, we made the measurements. This site is definitely darker. Sometimes it's a matter of impression, because if you have a site that has, let's say, waist high pier, pier lights that are down facing and they happen to be, let's say, um, red or orange in color, they can be fairly bright, but they're not a, going to affect your astronomical observing at all because they're directing down. They're in a low energy towards dark red mode and they don't project upward. So it may visually appear like all these little post lights are out and it's bright here. When in reality, the sky says, nope, it's not that bright here. Best to have a digital, unbiased, consistent recording across multiple sites to do your judgment. And here it is. This is a Squim Classic. And you can see the number there. By the way, 19.66 is a reasonably dark site. We were seeing in the... Um, 16s um, out at uh, um, Everglades Holiday Park. We think we can probably get to the 18 if they would turn off the street lights. It's powered by a nine volt rectangular battery. Um, it, it only operates on five volts internally, but it uses the nine volt battery because it has a, uh, a large watt hour capacity. So the battery lasts a good long time, but it is an alkaline battery. So if you're going to uh, not use your squim for a period of time, uh, much as Helen does, I would suggest taking the battery out. So if the battery does leak, it won't destroy your device. What are the numbers across the bottom, 17, 18, 19, 20? Um, that is uh, essentially magnitudes per square arc second. You can actually see the picture that shows like the brightest would be a lamp or the moon. And yeah. then as it goes darker, you can see the numbers go 19, 23. Yeah, so that's, that's what kind I, of yeah. the idea that gives you. So much, much like stellar magnitudes start at zero and they go to smaller and smaller numbers as it gets darker. These numbers do the same. So 17 is your, your typical streetlight area. 
And as you get darker and darker, you can see more stars. And you get to 23. But these are not identical to stellar magnitudes. These are essentially energy per square area. And it's baseline um, off of something that's arbitrary. But it is agreed by a number of individuals. So it's it essentially amount of uh, uh, energy per square area. And it's an inverse. So you have 17 being a brighter sky than a 23. So a 19 would say, you can see a reasonable number of stars. And here's the sensor. Now you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute. The sensor is here and the display is here. How does the display not affect the sensor? Well, that's where the lens focusing comes into play. And the second thing is it makes its measurements with the display turned off. And then once it's made its calculations, it turns on the display and presents the number. And this little clear thing here around the button, uh, I think that's just protection. They need to make a button that's recessed, but this is a cheaper button. So most people just take this little clear thing off and they can feel the button and press it. So documenting light dome encroachment. This is something that is expected of uh, International Dark Sky Association Dark Sky Parks. If you want to get a certificate as a dark sky park, you have to sign up for regularly recording your um, nearby light dome. And I know that for Big Cypress, this extends all the way across to uh, Miami and all the way across to Naples. So they are expected to measure the light dome from Miami and the light dome from Naples with every, I think they have to make measurements monthly and report quarterly. So uh, the National Park Service, when it wants to get a dark sky certificate for a particular park, that's what they're signing up for. And my suggestion to them was get yourself a handful of squims, put them on poles, connect them up to your park network, or maybe get a 4G connection to them. And that makes it automatable, which means consistent recording and reliable recording. There's no, whoops, we forgot to measure that that month. Um, and their response was, well, aside from the fact that they're the National Park Service, they'd have to go find a third party vendor that would package it up and install it for them because it's equipment and they don't know how to do that stuff. And that would cost money that they'd have to budget. But, you know, buying a meter and a backup meter and then just tasking the park rangers to go out and make the measurements, time to make the donuts, actually forces the environmentalist rangers to go to those locations. So they, uh, they use the rangers and they use the handheld meters to make their measurements. And they log all the data and they send it up to the IDA, IDA and it produces these pictures of light dome. They're really sad to look at sometimes. If you see a dark site, and you see that light dome over a five-year period, you can actually see the encroachment of big cities near dark locations. So if you were to look at uh, Kissimmee Prairie Preserve, which is a uh, dark sky park with a certificate, you can actually see the growth of the metropolitan areas around it as their light dome increases on the darkness of, of uh, you know, Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. Same thing with Big Cypress. You can see how the light dome from Miami is growing. But the other reason why you want to make these measurements on a regular basis is uh, if you happen to be a location where things change over time, you know, you're at a park and somebody puts in um, new dump toilets nearby and you've got to have light so people can see what's going on at the dump toilets and they, have to, they happen to put in horrible lighting for the dump toilets, then you can spot that down to a one month level in your monthly recordings that you turn in quarterly and the IDA will go, uh, you're in jeopardy of losing your dark sky certificate because of the new lights you recently installed. You might wanna go back and put some shields on those suckers. So this allows the IDA to try and keep things in check. Also, if you do find places where there are certain lights that are spoiling your night sky, you can find those light sources and do something to mitigate them, put shields on them, change them from bright white to more of a, uh, a you know, a brighter red orange and see how that affected 
the light pollution of your dark site. And you can see that because if you have consistent and uniform reporting over time, you can see how things are not only getting worse, but also maybe how they're getting better. In conclusion, if you're going to go to all the effort to evaluate dark sites for are they dark or not, then you want to use something that's unbiased. You want to have a documented, consistent set of capture methods. You want consistently used devices, recording procedures, and you want to do this consistently across sites and make them as free from human physiological or individual unsuspecting biases as possible. Apples to apples, as the saying goes. But if you're just going, hey, I was at this uh, site recently and uh, looks pretty dark. Well, that's an initial call to do a better digital evaluation. Because sometimes you'll encounter new dark sites. There'll be a new park go up or um, change what was on a property to have some buildings that don't need as much light. And, uh, you know, they converted a shopping mall to a public storage facility or something. And maybe it doesn't need as much light on the outside. And purpose-built devices like a uh, unihedron SQM and one of the various models of it have significant benefits to consistent, reliable recording. And it has fewer biases because we have uh, numerical evaluation based upon the ambient temperature. So a uh, purpose-built device will do it better than, I got this app on my phone for free. And if you have to do measurements on a regular basis, having a connected uh, SQM device with, a, with an app that can record from multiple of these is the best way to do this over a large area uh, to get consistent reporting and so that you can see how things change over time. And I put in some links about how you go about measuring light pollution, uh, creating some of those stellar magnitude charts. If you're interested in a uh, unihedron SQM, how to find that, and the app that will record values if you buy a data connected version of an SQM, it's called Nightwear. Nightwear is not actually made by Unihedron. It's uh, made by a, a different company. They don't charge anything for the software. I think there's a, a deal where Nightwear gets funded by Unihedron, but is not owned by Unihedron. But uh, they seem to work with um, the Unihedron various models. Okay, and that's just the app, night, Nightwear. The Unihedron SQM is the device, and it comes in various models, whether you right. want just a display, or you want it USB connected, or RS-232 connected, uh, I bought the one that's Ethernet connected because I know once you connect it Ethernet, you can hook it up to uh, a laptop with a direct cable. You can hook it up to a local network. You can measure them across the Internet. And the Nightwear SQM reader app can read from uh, a Unihedron SQM that's network connected. So you can have the app be at a central location and then read out the current value from multiple sites. So literally in a matter of minutes, if you've got a half a dozen sites you have to measure, you can measure all of them. A great way to package it all up and do it on a consistent and uniform basis. And for those people that uh, say I ought to promote things a little more, it's only for just thanks for watching. It's thanks for watching. And if you like this, please comment, like, subscribe, or set your notify or follow. And so send one. I, I don't so know one that is another way, that the cheap way where I start before I get my, my little sensor. You can go on darksky.org. I'm going to put the app on the, or the app node, the, the web page on the uh, chat. You can go there, and there are two ways for you to measure uh, the sky. You can look at pictures in the graphic that you can print or, you know, just look look on your phone that is the two ways and then they show the constellations for that month and then you can count how many pictures do you see in that specific constellation and you can have an idea uh which uh of, of how much of the of the sky it's like polluted or not so you can do that you can download the app and you can also do that with uh, just looking at the pictures. And they do like a marathon that specific dates during the year that you can look. So now May is going to be between 14 and the 23rd. It's normally when the, the moon's not in the sky during the night.
so you can measure the light pollution in your area so you you can have an idea and then that helps to do if you ever use uh, google maps or any other kind of map that you can put an overlay of light pollution that data that they collect it's used in that so it's like uh, two things that you can do so the the marathon is the globe at night the org and then you can measure the the you know the light pollution and you can help the database and it shows during the year so i've been doing that like about 10 years so i'm adding the data for multiple years of the same location so this is a very valuable uh data set that you can help citizen uh science yeah i, I actually had that link that you provided already in the presentation can you can you um, open for everyone to see yeah now this this is better than basically eyeballing it but it still has a couple of biases which is the person doing it so if you have two people doing it and they have different capabilities with their eyes, then uh, yeah, there, there's going to be uh, not deliberate bias, but just unsuspecting bias. Now, I would say, if you look at it where it says May 14th through the 23rd, there's a lunar eclipse the 15th and the 16th. Don't do it those two nights, because we have then, a giant uh, full moon. They, whenever they choose the constellation, the specific constellation is going to be far away from the moon. So take a look at uh, uh, one of the pages. Oh, and by the way, anybody who's watching who prefers other languages, if you go on this site, you can find the maps in multiple languages. So the spe specific you can find in English and Spanish uh, and Portuguese that, you know, the most spoken languages here. So there's a many language that you can do that. So it's super awesome to kind of contribute <clears throat> for the data set. So I'm trying to go to globe at night. And the, the best, the best project you can put on, on, on your phone and do that. And you only have to push a button. You do like with the paper, you go right down on the paper and you need to go on a web page to add your data to the data set. On the phone, this is automatically. You just put on your phone and it's like an app and you just find the constellation, what it looks like, and then you choose, you know, kind of the magnification. And then in my case, because I have the sky meter, I can use the sky meter data set. That's more uh, precise. You know, my internet is low too, Morel. I don't know what's going on tonight. The whole internet is slow. <laughs> yes, I, I tried to open the page. To, it took me forever. I don't know if you noticed that was like, Gah. So like, it's not just my older laptop being slow as you Nope. Know. No, it's the internet. That's slow. weird. Okay. So, so, so you, you, you use uh, AT&T DSL for your internet? Yes. I still. use AT&T 4G. So that's the same so, backbone. It's, that's the same AT and T yeah. backbone to the core of the internet. Here it is. All of a sudden, oh, it got yeah. faster again. All right. So this is globe at night, and uh, as I, as I mentioned, they will give you a constellation and the stars, and you literally are identifying which stars you can and cannot see. Can you see this constellation? Well, I don't know. It's crux. You can't see it from you know, North Florida upwards, because it's the Southern Cross. Sometimes it's funny to see this sort of stuff. Four locations south of 34 South, Crux is circumpolar. Great, but what about for locations north of that? They'll mm -hmm. pick something like Orion. But you've mm -hmm. got to pick a different constellation because Orion's not always up at that time of night throughout the year. So if finding at the globe at night, so you have to look at Pratis. You can go there, but which page you look at? It's Global Night Finding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's so globalnight.org. You can see on your phone, on your app, you see the, that way. Let me see if I can find the right place for you. Let me go there. Because well, it, it, it kind of shows it. like the, the what you can print out and see uh, Global Night. Okay. Science. You know, this is definitely far better than eyeballing it. The problem is no temperature oh. compensation and uh, physiologic inherent biases. 
Yeah, the but you know the the temperature is not that important when you use your eyes, so it's it makes. Oh yes, it is. No, I don't have hot pixels in my eyeballs. You don't have to have hot pixels for it to not show the same values. Yeah, but you know it's it's not that precise as you know the sky meter. It's like a rounded uh, constellation. They give you basic, I think, six blocks of, uh, for you to choose. Oh, my goodness. It is so slow. I'm going to look Yeah, I know. It's just, just me. Yeah, okay, I'm so trying are, to open it. These are magnitude charts for the constellation Leo at zero degrees. That's zero degrees latitude. Let's change this to... Uh, 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 20 degrees. 20 degrees north latitude. We're about 26, 27. Now, you can see that if your sky happens to be magnitude zero, then you can only see stars that are magnitude zero or brighter. And uh, human vision tops out at magnitude, they're a little less than magnitude six. A human being cannot see more stars than you see in this pattern. Okay, I'm going to send you the the chart for, for people to understand what, what you were talking about. So this is old. This is for May 2020. But I'm going to go there and give you kind of a... It's not the... the it's the one... The app is the one on, on Australia. So this so is Leo magnitude five and a half. Globe at night. Now for people that are not familiar with constellations, this is the zero coordinate within the constellation that they're looking for. But how do you know it's Leo? Well, if you have fewer stars in the sky, it's actually easier to find it. Okay, let me go down. Um, oh, you, you know, I have something else for you to see, but you have to scroll down on the page. I'm going to send the, the, the link on the chat for you to see. Oh, yeah, you got it. You, you found it. You found it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. You don't even yeah. need to look. So that you can see. When you print out or on your phone, you're going to find something like this. So uh, the stars that you normally get, like the very bright, like Sirius or Antares. So if you can only see those stars, it means that the limit magnitude is, is, is zero. Zero. So only the really bright stars you can see. And then when you get to magnitude seven, so when you have like, you know, big cypress, we probably get around mag magnitude six. So well, you see stars the, the, that are around magnitude five or six, depending on the limit of your eyes. Right. The, hum the human eyeball is going to be somewhere between five and six. Your, your eyeball is never going to get to seven. But you also have to understand the field of view. Um, if you look at this one. It's the same one. The, the, all of them have the same uh, field of view for you to mark. So when you print out, you have Correct. all Correct, but but it's supposed to center on Leo. Okay, it centers on Leo. But how many stars yeah. beyond Leo are included in this same chart? So here's Leo where Regulus is. Mm -hmm. But over here it's got Betelgeuse, which is in Orion. Yes. And it's got Sirius, which is in Canis Major. And it's got Arcturus. And it's got the Big Dipper. So if you're not familiar with the Leo constellation... Yeah. Which of these stars are in Leo or which of them are beyond Leo? So you need, yeah, a little, so you need a little bit of awareness of what's up in the sky and the field of view of this chart. Basic, there you can only see like four stars in, 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 in Leo. So you see Regulus, the Nebula. Then you can see in the back is, yeah. So no, just three stars. Two stars. Two yeah. stars, Denebola and Regulus. No, that one I think is Shertan. You can see Shertan. But that's this one? I think, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think. I Maybe. think that's in another constellation. <laughs> so if you change for the next picture, you're going to see the same field of view, but it's going to have more stars. And then you should. Yes, but they don't name them all. And it's super easy for you to kind of have an idea which one. Um, in in fact, in fact, when they have more and more stars, they put it's fewer and fewer names. It's hard for you to names. find it. Yeah, it's hard for you to find it because it's like, yeah. woo, so you know, full well, of. Well, that's stars. the problem we have with, when you go to Big Cypress on a good night. The problem isn't look at all the stars you can see. The problem is, yeah, you know, how do I find my way around? Because there's so many stars. You find your way around by naked eyes seeing 
the nebulas uh, and clusters that you cannot see naked eye from brighter locations. So yeah. you, when you go to Big Cyprus in the wintertime, you don't go looking for the Orion constellation. You go looking for the Orion nebula and the flame nebula. And once you can spot those, that will give you a triangulation of where Orion is. Because when, you, when you're at Big Cyprus on a dark night, those three belt stars are just almost invisible. It's hard to see them because there's just so many stars that are roughly the same brightness. Over the years, we, we've seen less stars because I, oh, yeah. I remember seeing the time that I didn't use glasses that I went there. I think I could see magnitude seven. Well, I think that's your eyes too. Or maybe I, I memorized the map. Like Les used to say that I memorized the map. I'm like, you cannot see those stars. I'm like, I'm pointing to them. Look at the telescope. It's like, no, no, yeah, no, no. We, we, did better, we, did, we did better than that. The same, we had Don and Arno and you doing the same test. We would hand you the green laser and we would say, I want you to point at the dimmest star you can see. And you'd be, you know, to people like um, Les and myself, you were just pointing out an open space. And we grabbed the binoculars and you would point at something that we couldn't see. And we'd look in the binoculars and see where the laser was pointing at. Yeah, there's a star there. And then we'd go look it up in the charts and find out it's like magnitude 5.6. Yeah, uh, I, I could get there. Yeah. But Arno is older than me and Arno could see even better than me. He could I don't know if he still is. I don't know if he still deep. is. I don't know if yes. he still is, but he could easily see magnitude seven star. He could see better than I did. And I'm, yeah. I was, no, Don, Don Wellington was the youngest of the group. No, no. Don was the youngest of the group, but Arno had the better eyes. So yes. there was always a competition between Don and Arno. And they and could he, both see, they could both and see then, stars. And then, that and we then Don see. got pissed off because I could see better than he did. Uh, there was one night, yeah, I, I think he was just having a bad night. You know, well, people have that. It was that. the only night I had chance. Yeah, people have that. Based uh, upon I think the chemistry it was the only of your night eyeball, that we compared. Yeah, based upon the chemistry of your eyeball, did you eat a lot of sweets in the afternoon? You're, no, you're, I, w I was only allowed to eat sweets on the weekends. No, no, I was referring to Don. Oh, okay. If he, if he yeah, had eaten then, a lot of yeah. sweet snack foods that afternoon, his night vision would not be as good as yours because you weren't into eating sweets. Yeah. No, and the other thing is that because I'm born in the, uh, in the equator, near to the equator, uh, I had to wear uh, dark glasses since I was very young. My dark glasses had like the, the curve, you know, uh, ear back. Like my, my dad bought like Ray-Bans and then he changed the, 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 the arms, so it, it could go like children's arms to, to fit in our faces because the irradiation in the equator perpendicular. So, yeah, yep. you have to wear uh, dark solar glasses. So it's not that that is that good. My vision is because I didn't spoil that much. <clears throat> Except all those solar observing events we went to. Yeah. And the amazing thing was that at Yellowstone National Park, at high altitude, at night, my glasses turn dark, which meant there's UV at night. <laughs> yes, there is. And the clicks of the, the, the Geiger counter were higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah radiation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we are very yeah. high. It wasn't even the stones that were radioactive around the yellow stones. Yeah. But because we are in a higher altitude, we had a little bit more radiation. The yeah, only were, rocks that I found radioactive there, like a little bit, is basically like, you know, a little bit higher than the, the background, uh, was the, 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 where they have the, the volcanic glass mountain. That's mm -hmm. the only place that I saw like higher radioactivity. Well, that's because that was radioactivity coming from the core of the earth out to the surface. Radioactive glass, yeah. But uh, if they ever create photovoltaic cells, that can pick up energy from UV, then they're actually going to produce higher levels of energy than the ones that are more sensitive to the redder parts of the spectrum. Because yeah, but the problem altitude, with it when you get UV, whenever you get any kind of cloud, you have very low uh, uh, absorbance because it's it's on the it's absorbed by vapor of water. 
yes, so it, it would work. It would work for high altitudes. Yes, but lower that's what altitudes. I was referring to. Is if you have a UV sensitive photovoltaic cell and you put it at the same place high altitude that you put those giant telescopes, maybe you can run the telescopes off of UV power even at night. It was quiet at night. Night. It was sunset. Uh, it was a uh, uh, how you call it after the sunset, but it's still like astronomical twilight. Yes, it was astronomical twilight. All I know is dark enough that I had to have the headlights on the car. Yeah. And I went, how come it's just dark out here, but my headlights aren't working? And I took my glasses off and I looked at them and went, my glasses are dark. This is nighttime. Come on. So, yeah, there's UV at high altitude and it's there at night. So if you have a photo cell that works at high altitude in UV, you can actually generate well, electricity. The problem, it was like activated by the muons yeah i'm sure that's what it was was the muons so okay. but basic like you 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 don't have to have the equipment for you to measure light pollution if you go to the places that we just mentioned you know uh, uh the to to see how to measure dark sky you can do that for anywhere you are in the world the site have multiple languages for you to download and you can also do that on your phone. And there are specific constellations that are chosen for the specific area. So those dates work for, uh, they choose constellation for the Northern Hemisphere and for the Southern Hemisphere. So you can participate and add the data. And you can actually have an idea compared places where you go. You, you don't even have to submit the data. You can only do that for yourself, like get the, the graphics, take a look and see if near your house you can have dark skies compared to the beach, compared to a, another place that you, you normally go and you have an idea how much light pollution that is. Yes, it's not an enormous expense at the $120 range for the classic model, um, but if you're only going to use it occasionally um, or once, then it's probably easier and less expensive to do it with these star charts. Uh, but if you're going to do it on a regular basis, like Helen does, and I was thinking I was going to do, then um, yeah, a device works better. Uh, because if you want to pass along your information to IDA, because you want a dark sky park certificate, um, they're going to take your information from your charts, and then they're going to recommend could you get an SQM and then you know numerically record the data? So uh, there are ways of doing it without spending money on the device. But if you're going to do it yeah. for real. And device. I think that is even an app that you can download on your phone and use the camera to read how dark is the sky. But I think those apps work better if you have a sky meter to calibrate your phone, to teach your phone, uh, you know. But other than that, you can actually do a graphic that is not calibrated to your phone, but this is constant measurement based on your phone. So your phone is going to be the base uh, line, and then you have an idea of the light pollution for your own measurement. So there are apps that you can download on your phone that use it almost works like the 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 sky meter but sky meter is better because it's going to be a black and white measurement and also the field of view on your phone varies uh based upon which camera you use what model of phone you have what generation of phone you have i remember when they first came out with these apps um for measuring sky brightness and they started on an apple phone i think it was about an i uh, i4 or something like that and um they came out with it for the four and they were really proud of it. And then Apple came out with the five and they changed the um, chip they used for the camera and it had a different level of sensitivity. So they had to go in and adjust the application for it to say, and which model iPhone do you have? And when there were so many different varieties of chips used in different models, and then they wanted to make it work on Samsung as well, that they said, we're just going to give up on trying to second guess the camera and the camera does not digitally communicate to the app its specifications. What you want it to know is the electron well sensitivity. In other words, when an electron enters the pixel, how much energy does it transfer for measuring out of the pixel? 
and then what is the field of view of the lens for the camera because if it goes down too far to the sides, it's got too wide a field of view, you're now getting in a lot of light pollution along the horizon instead of just what's overhead. And the way that they've compensated for that is they literally just throw away pixels around the outer edge of a ring and the only part of the pixels they take is from the center of the image. So they've been trying to make it better, but uh, SQM is a way to go if you need to do this on a regular basis and you need to digitally evaluate this for like the International Dark Sky Association, SQM is a way to go. Now, unfortunately, I don't know of another vendor that makes an SQM as a device, uh, certainly not one in the same price range. There are professional light meters, but no, they don't I produce. Sh I found one that is black sky meter. I'll show Alex is free, E for everyone. That's you might the app. have another one that, yeah, that's that, the app. Yeah, the one of the apps. On, yeah. um, I, I'm not downloading it, but uh, I don't see anything that bad here. It doesn't show any commercials and doesn't mention anything. Yeah, but so yeah, there, there are ways for you to measure. How does it how does it compensate for the specifications of the chip used in the camera? How does Above it my pay grade. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. You, you might be you, able to answer that question better than I am. Yeah, I've, I've looked at these apps and they are far better than just basically eyeballing it. I will say that. But do not trust them as if they're equivalent to having a sky, sky quality meter. Because a sky quality meter, the electronics of the design are purpose for that. So they vary uh, to a very high degree of reliability and accuracy can measure sky brightness. But I don't know oh, of I another manufacturer beyond Unihedron. Deep Sky Camera. Fascinating. That is an, an app that takes picture of the deep sky on the phone. It shows a raw, uh, raw uh, JPEG. The way that they do that is they have their own driver for the camera chip and they don't use the normal exposure levels, and they take multiple images back-to-back -back very fast, and then they stack them and average it, and it comes out much darker than the camera would normally have the ability to take a picture of, but it's not noise compensated, so you get a lot of noise in the image, so they do a digital noise reduction on the results of the image, which hey, means when it's you on take the phone. a picture... It, it's instant gratification. It's not instant because... When you take a picture with that app, it might take you 20 seconds to get the image, and you have to hold the phone steady during that. Yeah, but you don't need the, you know, expensive computers and expensive cameras and cameras. Or the pictures that you've taken of what looks to be a dark sky, and you see like three or four stars in it, and then I post-process the image, and all of a sudden there's, you know, 30 stars in it. Yep. So it's called stretching the image. Uh, there's data there that to make it look like a pretty picture, um, they darken it up. But when they darken it up, all those really dim stars just disappear. But the data is still there. OK, uh, any other questions about how you determine how dark the sky is or how much light pollution the sky has in it? Yeah. I. No, nope. I have not been keeping up with this, but nope, nope. from what I gather, uh, lightning has hit the Everglades and started fires. Yes. Well, the particulates in the air must fog over everything and make the sky lighter than it should be. Yes, ash. Um, whenever you're at a site that you think is dark, you want to go there when it's a clear sky, as in no clouds, and you want to go there when it's an a slightly overcast sky, because if there are nearby lights that you don't see from your actual location, but they're nearby, they can actually project up and reflect off of particulates in the atmosphere, like water and ash. Yeah. So when, when we were on uh, Yellowstone, we were sold one of the attractives to visit Yellowstone and stay there for you know about a week or so was for the sky would be amazing. Mm -hmm. We couldn't see a star. We went during the, the summer. There was so much smoke coming from California that you could yeah. smell it. Yeah, you couldn't see the top of the mountains. It was awful, so much smoke. Yeah, that was the uh, wildfires in California actually sending soot over to uh, adjacent states 
and getting up as high as Yellowstone. So the ash in the sky was there all night long, and we couldn't see anything. You can so, yes. smell, the, smell the smoke. In oh, the absolutely, sky. yeah. Oh, you yeah. can smell it outside tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the news media is uh, not really providing adequate coverage. Yeah. They need to take their uh, helicopter and get a, an aerial map of the area that is currently burning, and uh, they don't. They just show the, the fire line and a small segment of it, so you have no empathy for how large an area is burning. And remember, once the fire goes through an area, there's no fuel left there. So unlike places where there are giant forests, like out in California, it's grass fires in Florida. So there's always a perimeter edge that's burning, but there's nothing on fire in the middle of it. What causes fire? Lightning. lightning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in the case of South Florida, lightning is usually the, the primary cause. Any more questions about tonight's presentation? Hearing nothing, then I'm going to end the audio. Okay.